Okay, so hi everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about, I think, two Bible characters maybe we don't talk about too often. Um, and I think one of the big, the big themes we're going to be looking at is how two people that maybe didn't feel seen by God and maybe didn't feel important, especially, I want to say, Hagar, because um, if, if you know anything about who Hagar is, she um, is not a person of importance. I think we would a lot of times think of Sarah as being the more important um, Bible character, but here I kind of wanted to um, not only highlight Sarah's story and her faithfulness to God, but also what Hagar role was and um, how God saw her and cared for her too. So me being a little bit of a person that um, cheers for the underdog, sometimes I, I, I purposely put her name first here because I think, you know, we all have heard of Sarah Abraham's wife in the Bible, but maybe sometimes um, Hagar gets overlooked and, and seen as maybe, you know, I, I think I used to think this way, oh, Hagar, she's all right. Uh, she's kind of the not favored one. And Sarah is the important one because she was the mother of the nation of Israel. But I think we want to look at both and see how God, God works with and through both of them. So, um, so I, I call this, um, you know, we, Kitty did the series on a tale of two Kings. And so this is kind of the story, um, a tale of two women, because, uh, in this, we're not going to, there's a lot more about Sarah in the Bible than we're going to talk about today, but we're going to focus on this particular narrative of the interactions and the events related to these two women and how um, God worked through them and the birth of their children and the forming of the nation of Israel. So a lot of times, you know, there is sort of this, um, there, this opposition that's going on between the two, that's kind of the nature of their relationship. They're in conflict. Um, so we're going to see as we look through these Bible passages that although these two women were in opposition, God cared for and worked through both of them to accomplish his plan for the nation of Israel and the world. And I think, and so through each woman, woman, um, God, God made a nation um, so, you know, it's very important for us to look and see how that happened and, and kind of what the contrast is and what, what we can, uh, kind of glean from that. So first I wanted to share a little profile of each woman, um, just so we can get kind of an idea of who they are, their backgrounds. Um, first we have Hagar, her name means light. So, um, I just, I just found that a little bit interesting what their names meant, especially um, when we get to Sarah, we'll see, and Sarah, I will see that she had a name change. Um, an interesting thing that I didn't really make a distinction from before I kind of looked into this more is that she was actually purchased as Sarah's slave, um, not Abram. So um, she was not a concubine. Uh, so she wasn't really there to serve Ab Abram and his needs but she was um, kind of there to help Sarai with whatever she needed help with. And she was sort of at her mercy, whatever she wanted her to do was kind of her life's purpose. And the notable thing here is she really didn't have a choice in what was happening to her. She didn't have autonomy. Um, and she, um, yeah, she was a slave. So, um, she was used to give Abram a son in place of Sarai, who was barren. So we'll kind of see the story, how that, that plays out um, in, in the narrative where, you know, Sarah decides that she's going to take matters into her own hands because she can't have a child. And that's kind of what Hagar's role is here. Um, she gave birth to Abram's son, Ishmael, who was first born, um, but eventually was not actually the heir um, of, of Abram. She was treated harshly by Sarah. She was, she was mistreated. And then eventually she ran away to the desert. So, um, but she came back for a while because she was obedient to God. When he told her, go back, go back to your, uh, your mistress and go serve her and submit to her. And she did. So I think there's, um, a lot of commendable things to be, to be said about Hagar and her life and her, 
um, obedience to God. So I think because of that, God, you know, really saw her and, um, you know, she didn't, she wasn't as fortunate as Sarah, but she obeyed God and then was eventually rescued by him and kind of given a new life in a new land with her son. So we'll see how that plays out when we go through these scriptures. We also have Sarah, Sarai. Um, many would say she's probably more of a prominent character in the Bible. Um, Abraham, so much more, more so, but we're focusing on this particular story because, um, you know, these women played such important roles in, in how this, uh, in how the nation of Israel was formed. She was married to Abram, and then there are some name changes. We'll, we'll uh, read that part of the story too. They were, um, she was uh, from a wealthy family. She lived in Ur with Abram, and they were, they were wealthy, and then they kind of, they went through a famine, and then they became wealthy again while they were in Egypt. They had to live in Egypt for a while, um, and then she was physically beautiful is, is one of the, uh, a big characteristic that, that is, um, emphasized in the Bible a couple times that, <clears throat> so that even when she was older, she was, she was very physically beautiful. Um, the thing that was kind of a burden to her was that she was barren and it was very important for women to have a son, a male heir, and she felt a lot of pressure. So that's why she gave Hagar to Abram to bear him a son. She eventually, we'll see that she gave birth to Isaac. He is the fulfilled fulfillment of God's promise to them. Um, and she became a mother of nations. And then lastly, you see through this kind of her, you know, her character development that she, she really didn't trust God at first, but she learned to trust God and she was faithful to him and to her husband. So um, those are just a few uh, facts about her. So I'm, I don't have the scriptures up on the screen, but I am just going to read. Um, if you want to get your Bible out or your Bible app open or um, whatever you use um, and follow along, or if you just want to listen, that's okay too. I'm just going to read um, a few passages here that give us the, the overall story of uh, of these two women and how they, their stories intersect. So uh, first we were starting with um, Genesis 15. I didn't really, <clears throat> I'm not gonna read that passage, but the background is that God had promised Abraham that he would have an heir that would be his own son, not a household servant. Abraham was, Abram was very concerned that he was not going to have an heir that was actually his son. He was thinking that a household servant of his would have to be his heir because he had no, no son. Um, and that, but God promised him that it, he would have a son and that his descendants would be numerous as the stars. So that's kind of what the, um, where the story really starts, but um, we're going to see uh, kind of what, what happened when um, this, this uh, promise didn't really, wasn't really believed in the way that it should have been. The trust for God was not there. So we're going to look, just look at um, Genesis 16 verses one through six. It says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, you see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. So here we see that what the, the thing was that Sarai had already, um, you know, we saw in the last slide, she, she'd already been in the desert with, um, with Abram for like 
uh, in the land of Canaan for 10 years. So she was getting older here and she was starting to feel desperate for a child. It was her obligation as a wife to give him a child. I don't know, you know, the scripture doesn't really say, or, and I'm not familiar with the customs of the time, but um, as she may have been afraid that Abram would leave her destitute because she was not fulfilling her, um, her role as a wife. Either way, she was really struggling to have faith and trust that, you know, things were going to be okay. God was going to take care of her and that this was something that they were promised. Um, but it really was, um, a big problem because barrenness infertility was considered a defect or even kind of a spiritual curse that she did something wrong. And that's why she was not having a child, um, that she, um, was supposed to have. Um, so she, the way she deals with this is, um, it's actually, not the right way to deal with it. She took, instead of trusting God and having faith, especially since he told them they were going to have a child together after many years, she just decided to take matters into her own hands because her fertile years were ending. She basically forced Hagar into sleeping with Abram to bear, to bear him a son. She decided it was her prerogative what, um, to do with, with, um, Hagar. So, cause she was kind of, she basically owned Hagar and it, it wasn't, um, and then Abram went along with it. So that might show um, a little bit of his, his motive was either to please her or he wasn't quite trusting God um, the way that he should have been in the situation. But either way, that's kind of, that's how, the, how it played out. And um, we look in 16 verse four, and then once Hagar conceived, she kind of um, it says she had contempt for Sarah. And I think this means that she started to feel a little bit superior, like, oh, you're my, you know, you're my mistress, but who can have the baby? Me. It was, it's, it's me that's fertile and blessed, you know? So there, that kind of started a conflict there where they, you know, they were not able to, to get along. And um, there was just some serious um, harshness there because that was, that was Sarai's response to that was, you know, that, that really made her angry and feel, um, disrespected, slighted, whatever. She just, she did not feel, um, <clears throat> good feelings toward Hagar. So, um, her response was to be very harsh with Hagar. Abram allowed it for whatever reason. Um, and she was so harsh. We don't know what she did, but she was so harsh that it caused Hagar to run away. So, We'll see what, what Hagar did here in the next few verses. So let's go down to verse uh, 16, verse 7. It says, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. So we see her plan was she was going to run back to Egypt. That's where she came from. She was an Egyptian maidservant. Um, that at some point came to live with Abram and Sarai. Um, and she was going to go back because um, that was her home. And she was going to go through the Negev desert region. And then the angel of the Lord met her at the spring of water. Um, and she said, you know, I'm running away from my mistress. The, and then verse nine, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will greatly multi so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall live at odds with all his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her through, through the angel, of the Lord. I think there's a, a sense of agency here, not, um, a direct um, encounter. It says, you are El Royai. For she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore, the well was called, and excuse my Hebrew, uh, Ber Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Uh, Hagar bore Abram a son, and Habram, Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. And then, um, 
so we see that this encounter she's she's talking with the angel of the lord which is basically um the same as visiting with with god himself um and i think it's notable to see that um that this is the first visit of the angel of the lord uh it's the first record of some of the angel of the Lord visiting a person in scripture. So we had Adam and Eve in the garden. God was with them walking in the cool of the day. But since that, there's not a record of God appearing um, to anyone of God's, the angel of the Lord appearing um, as a representative to God, to anyone. So it wasn't to someone of esteem, um, you know, not to Abraham, not to a king, not someone like that. It was to an Egyptian slave woman. And I think that shows us a lot about how God sees people and their importance that he would um, show up for someone in, in such a situation where they really needed him and no matter what their, their status was in society. Um, so we see here that the angel made a promise to Hagar that she was going to have a son named Ishmael. And then the meaning of the name Ishmael means God hears. So God really hears her cries. He hears what, you know, her needs. She's in the desert. It's really not a good situation. Um, and so Hagar called God Elroy, which means the God who sees me. So God has heard um, and God has seen her. And so um, because of that, she really has had this powerful encounter. She she obeys, she submits and obeys God. And she, she goes back to Sarai's tent. Um, and then later she gave birth to Ishmael. So I think it's really important. We see that this encounter with God truly, truly encountering God is life changing for her. And she is able to, you know, endure a less than ideal situation because she's, she's obedient and she really knows that God, um, loves, sees, and hears her as a person and, and understands where she is, no matter what her circumstances. And I think that's a really important part of the story. Okay. So next we're going to go on and, and look at, um, you know, is Ishmael and, uh, his birth and, and, um, and how that relates to God's promise. So, um, so God had promised Abraham Let's see. I'm sorry. So, so um, actually we missed that part in scripture, but basically in verse 16, I'll go back. It says that Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So she went back to them and had Ishmael and Ishmael grew up as a full member of Abram's family and was loved and cared for by Abram. So um, then we're going to see that um, that God promises Abram, um, again, there's a, a, a covenant between Abram and God that God's going to provide him an heir, um, not through Hagar, but through Sarai. So let's look at 17. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. From you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you through their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God and to you and to your offspring after you. So God's making very big promises to Abram. And so, um, and then we're going to skip down to verse 15. There's a bunch of stuff about, you know, the part of that covenant comes circumcision and Abram obeys God and has, has um, his, all the men um, of his tribe circumcised and things like that. So that's part of it. Um, the symbolism and the, the, the obedience that Abram does before God. So God said to like, did I miss? Okay, no. So, um, so God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So we're going to look at, um, a name change here. 
I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. God said, no, but your wife, Sarah, shall bear you a son and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. So Abraham, Abraham has, um, he does have a love for, for Ishmael and he wants good things for him too. So God says, I will bless him and make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. So here we see, this is, um, you know, 13 years later after Ishmael's birth, God made a promise that, you know, the next season, um, this season next year, God, that Sarah would, would be having a child, um, and that his son with her would inherit the covenant promises that God had given to him. So it would not be through Ishmael, although Ishmael would have his own blessings. Um, so Abram's name, so sorry if it's been confusing. Sometimes I forget when it changed and have trouble um, keeping that straight. But so Abram's name changed to Abraham. So Abram meant exalted father and Abraham means father of a multitude. So it's showing he was, he was an esteemed person before but God is multiplying his blessings. And now he is the father of a multitude, you know, symbolizing his um, fathering of the great nation of Israel. Um, so that's, that's the meaning of that name change. Sarah's name also changed to Sarah. So interestingly, both of these names mean princess. There's not that big of a difference, but each uh, definition means, um, has a little bit of a different connotation. Sarai indicates a, a woman of local authority. So kind of a local princess at the time. Um, so whereas Sarah has a more widespread meaning of power. So she would be more of a princess of a whole nation rather than a, a region. So, so that we're kind of seeing how God is showing them how his, um, his blessings are going to be bigger than they thought. And they're really going to have this, um, this important child that's going to be the beginning of the nation of Israel. Um, and we see here that Abraham laughed at the idea of becoming a father at his age. So he kind of was doubting it too. He was like, are you sure God? Um, <laughs> but God says, you know, but nonetheless, he followed through with God's command. He, you know, he believed God. Um, and then it was also notable that Ishmael was going to be become a great nation too, but it's going to be a different nation. It's not part of the covenant with Abram or Abraham. So then in the next chapter, we see that God, you know, kind of announces um, to Sarah that she's going to have a child um, at, you know, in the last chapter, it said the next season. So um, so God has determined that that's about to pass. And um, so let's look at 18 verses one through 15. It says, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men sitting, standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And they, he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. So this is kind of her 
um, announcement that this is about to happen. Um, now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did laugh. So, you know, so God announced that Sarah was going to have a child very soon. Sarah laughed because she was pretty much beyond childbearing years. And then God kind of rebukes her saying, this is not too hard for me, Sarah. This is not, you should not laugh at this basically. Um, and then she denies it that she laughed. She's afraid. Oh, I shouldn't have laughed. Um, I just laughed at God, <laughs> but, and God, you know, says, oh, I heard you. I heard you laugh. So you can't really, she can't really hide her true feelings from God, but, but God, God overlooks that and, and sees that, you know, he helps them develop their faith here is what I, is what I really see happening in these, in, in these passages, both Sarah and Abraham kind of both like, are you sure God we're, we're kind of old, but I see their, their faith really increasing and developing. And I think that's a good example for us as we um, go through different experiences in life. Okay. Um, next, we're going to see that God's fulfilled promise fulfilled. We're going to skip a couple chapters and see, uh, to the birth of Isaac, um, 21, uh, verse one through seven, the Lord dealt with Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah, as he had promised Sarah conceived and bore Abraham, a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham had given gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. So um, you see that though, though she doubted God, God, Sarah indeed gave birth to the promised child. Sarah was 90. Abraham was 100 when Isaac was born and she named their son Isaac, which means God has made me laugh. So, um, funny that she laughed at God when she found out she was having a child going to be having a child at her age, but also, um, that we see the joy that she has at this child being born. This is the thing she's been waiting for, for years. So, um, it really has um, a good meaning there behind his name. Then, um, you know, when, when Isaac gets a little bit older, we're going to see some more conflict happening between Sarah and Hagar. So let's look at 21, uh, eight through 14 it says the child grew and was weaned and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, Abraham playing with her son, Isaac. And I think what was happening here was um, some translations show that he was kind of teasing Isaac, which made Sarah very angry. So I think um, that's kind of what's going on here. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah tells, says to do, do as she tell, to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took a bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. So um, Sarah told Abraham to cast them away. I don't think that Abraham really wanted to do that. It says that he was, he was pretty, you know, distressed and, and displeased with this situation. But um, basically God told him that this is okay to do and that he would take care of them basically. Um, so so they, he went ahead and, um, 
let them go out and into the wilderness and um, allowed, allowed that to happen. So we're going to see, um, we're going to see how God um, provides for that situation because it looks pretty dire here. Um, so we'll just keep going with verse 15. It says, when the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot for she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. So the water runs out. It doesn't look like there's anywhere to go. So she's, she's like, at least I don't want to look at my child dying. That's terrible. Um, so she, as she sat opposite of him, she lifted up her voice and wept, but, um, the, we see what, how God responds to this. God steps in. It says, and God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So, so God heard Ishmael. He saw the situation was bad. He stepped in and he provided water for them. And he basically gave them a whole new life in the wilderness of Paran. He got a wife. I'm sure, you know, he took care of his mother um, into her old age. So God um, also promised to make Ishmael into a great nation. So it seems that God's still working, even though, you know, that was kind of the second secondary plan for, for, um, Abram to, to have a son through Hagar. God still provides for that part of the family. Um, even though it's not part of that covenant he made with Abram. Okay. So, so we kind of see things kind of ending up okay for Hagar and then God's promises are fulfilled through Sarai and Sarah and Abraham um, in Israel. And then that story obviously continues through the whole Bible. So um, let's look at um, the New Testament and what it has to say about this story as an illustration. Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, what I got from this is um, it, it kind of looks like it's a symbolism, okay? It's not a judgment on the character of Sarah and Hagar. It's just showing the difference between, um, it's using it as an allegory to show basically living by the flesh uh, and, and human effort versus living by faith and following the will of God. So um, when we look at, so we're gonna look at Galatians 4.22, and it says, um, or 21 it start, is where it really starts. It says, tell me you who desire to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. One, the child of the slave was born according to the flesh. The other, the child of the free woman was born through the promise. Now this is an allegory. These two women are two covenants. One woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the other woman responds to the Jerusalem above. She is free and she is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, you childish, childless one, you who bear no children. Burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pangs. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise like Isaac, but just as at that time, the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, and so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child, for the slave of this, child of the slave will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then, friends, we are children, not of the slave, but of the free woman. So um, this is just kind of an illustration um, of the difference between living by faith and living by the flesh. So Sarai illustrates living by human effort um, when she uses Hagar to conceive. The conception and birth of Ishmael symbolizes law, reliance on self-effort, the, the current Jerusalem they were living in, Judaism, and bondage. 
So we see that situation kind of being a parallel to, to those things. And then when we look at, um, by contrast, we see when Sarah conceived Isaac through faith and by God, um, by God's promise, we see the following things symbolized in that situation. We see grace, reliance on God's promise, kind of the new, the new covenant, um, the new Jerusalem, kingdom of God, and then freedom. We see that, you know, there's freedom here and then bondage with, um, with conceiving through slavery and uh, human effort. So those are just kind of some, some symbols that we see through this story that we can learn from. Um, so here are just a few reflections as we wrap up this, uh, thinking about this story in the Bible. Um, so first of all, though they were, they were really at odds with each other, you know, we can see some things, um, <clears throat> that the both, that both a Hagar and Sarah lacked in character, but overall we see some evidence that both Hagar and Sarah were faithful and obedient to God. So they did both fulfill kind of their roles that God um, had for them um, and what he wanted them to do. Both Hagar and Sarah were patient to see God's promises fulfilled to them, respectively. They each had to wait. You know, they didn't get, they didn't have necessarily control over um, when God's promises were, were fulfilled to them. And I think that that's something we can learn from being patient and waiting on God and um, trusting that he has um, promises to us that are going to be fulfilled. Another thing we can learn from their story is that God sees and cares for all of us, no matter what life circumstances we're in. Um, and that that's not, that doesn't just apply to people that are, you know, high in status or wealth. Um, but for everyone, God, um, God had promises for both Sarah, who was much more fortunate than Hagar and also for the, the, the slave woman. So, so God really cares about all of us. Um, so like Hagar, we sometimes find ourselves in frustrating situations, which we have no control over. Her story shows us that we can remain faithful to God, even when we're in hopeless circumstances. It's an extremely, um, powerful story of obedience and, um, just struggle and being able to remain faithful in dire circumstances. And like Sarah, sometimes we may struggle to believe God's promises. However, um, as we kind of saw her developing through the story that we can learn to trust him and be faithful to him despite our doubts. And then as illustrated in uh, Galatians 4, the story of Sarah and Hagar shows us the contrast of living by faith versus the flesh. So those are just a few things to think about as we reflect on, on this um, part of scripture. So another thing I just want to leave you with is that God sees you too. If you're kind of feeling like you're abandoned by God or he's not seeing you or caring for your life, I can assure you that that's not what's happening. It's that sometimes, you know, God takes a while to, fulf to um, fulfill his promises. We're still, you know, awaiting the hope of the kingdom of God. And so, um, you know, develop that endurance and that patience. And I know that that God really is going to bless you for your faithfulness. So just know that God sees you. God loves you, uh, no matter how important you may feel or unimportant. So um, I just want to take you to take that message with you that God's going to provide for you and um, that he loves you. So that's all I had to share. If you watch this on YouTube, please um, join us sometime. <laughs>